Hello class, this is section 3.4 and we are going to discuss some damped mass spring models. This simply means that we have a spring attached to a mass and there's going to be some something stopping the spring motion here. So you can think of this as a shock absorber in your bike for instance or you can think of it as the effect of friction on the spring. So let's consider what forces are acting on the spring. We have Hooke's law. Hooke's law basically tells you what happens, what the spring does to the motion of a mass. So if we let xt be position of mass, weight, let's call it weight, Hooke's law tells you that the force of the spring is minus k x, where k is the spring constant. So this tells you the force that the spring is applying. So it makes sense in that uh, if if your k is going very far, if your k is very big, if your x sorry, if your x is very big, it means that you're pulling your spring really far and this force will try to counteract that, that uh, stretching and to try, to pull it, try to pull the spring back. And so that's why if your x is huge, your force applied by the spring is going to be a very large negative number, signifying that the spring is trying to get things back to where they were. Another force that's acting on the spring is this little damper over here. And we call that the force of resistance. You can think of that as friction. Or you can think of it as uh, an actual, um, what do you call it, uh, an actual, I uh, can't remember what the word is, shock absorber, an actual shock absorber. And this resistance force is going to be minus C times velocity. And th this also makes sense intuitively. The faster you go, the more friction you generate. The faster you go, the more the shock absorber is going to push back. So we like to write everything down in terms of x, so we have minus c x prime instead. So these are all uh, in terms of t, if you may recall. So these are the two forces acting on the, on the weight. Sometimes you have an external force too, and this is just some sort of uh, external thing going on. I, I don't know, the wind may be blowing, you might have a magnetic field. So these are the three types of forces that are acting on that weight. So we can write that F is equal to the force of the spring plus the force of friction or resistance plus the force of whatever external is going on. So we have this equals minus Kx minus Cx prime plus F, whatever that is. On the left side, we also have another formula we can use to determine the forces acting on the weight. And that is Newton's law, which tells us that F equals MA. MA is also equal to MX double prime, of course. And this is new, just Newton's law. And this gets us a very friendly for a second order linear equation. MX prime plus C X M X double prime plus C X prime plus K X equals to F E T. So if this external force is non-zero, we have a non-homogeneous equation and we call this the forced situation. When we have an external force acting on the spring system. But usually we don't, so we usually just have to deal with a homogeneous equation here. So this is a very natural application of our the things we learned in the last section. So let's talk a bit about what possible behaviors a spring can have. And this, this actually boils down to what sort of solutions we can get out of this. So if you look at the characteristic equation, we can clearly get a few different answers. 
So case one, if we solve the characteristic equation, we have r equals minus c plus minus c squared minus 4mk over 2m as our two solutions. So there are two solutions, a plus 4 and n minus. And our x is going to be equal. OK, so if c squared is greater than 4mk, our x is going to be equal to c1 times e r1t plus c2 times e r2t. There's one other thing to note. If you look at our formula for r here, these, the c term is going to be minus c here is going to be negative. It's going to be negative. And c squared minus 4mk is going to be less than c. If uh, c squared, yeah, so, it's, so, so this is going to be the square root of c squared minus something else, so this is going to be less than c. So it's clear that r is always going to be negative for both of them. For r1, r2 are both negative. So what happens when t heads to infinity? then xt will head to 0. And this means that our spring will eventually just reach equilibrium. And we can see an example of this in uh, this following YouTube video. Hello class. And th this is going to be the video of uh, mass on a spring, but suspended in liquid hand soap, so there's a lot of friction a lot of damping, and you can see what happens to the spring. By the way, I think it's pretty cool that we are watching a YouTube video embedded in a YouTube video, embedded in a YouTube video. It's kind of a very Inception feel to it. Though I guess he isn't using YouTube in, the, in, this, in this video. It's probably a QuickTime player or something. But as you can see, there isn't any, there isn't any up and down oscillation. When you have this much friction, the spring just heads up that way to an equilibri equilibrium point. So it's kind of a boring motion if you have this much friction. And that's actually what our equation predicted. So you can see that there isn't any oscillation at all. You, as t increases, r1, r2 are both negative. So both of these terms go to 0. So it's kind of a boring little motion there but that gels with what the physics, the physics tells us. So let's consider the case instead where we have very little friction. So this was a case where we had a lot of friction, so like a lot, very thick hand soap. If instead we have very little friction, then uh, if C, so C is the friction coefficient, if you remember, for mk, then using the same formula, we know that R is going to be a, oh, minus a rather, minus a plus b i, or R is going to, R1 is going to be a minus a plus b i, R2 is going to be minus a minus b i. Let me make that minus sign a bit more obvious. There, R equals minus a. Minus a, so a is actually going to be just uh, c over 2m. If you look at the quadratic formula over here, it's obviously going to be negative. So this is going to just be xt equals e to the minus a times c1 cosine bt plus c2 sine bt. So this tells us, gives us two options. If c is 0, then we if c is 0, then a is 0, and we just get cosine and sine, so it's just going to be a periodic motion. If c is not 0, if c is not 0, we have oscillatory motion, so your cosine and sine are still going to be oscillatory, bouncing around a little bit, but we, we will head down to 
zero because um, oh wait sorry that should be a, that should be a t here. But as t goes to infinity, this goes to zero. Oscillations toward zero, and we can see an example of of this one too. Now let me move this around. Okay, so the black model is when there's no friction at all. You can see it just bounces up and down like that. Whereas the blue model here is the showing the damp the damp oscillation that we see throughout equations. So we, we do have oscillation, but it's getting uh, smaller and smaller as time goes on because of this E8 minus AT term.